Well, we did it. We made it to the final video in our Smocked Shirt Sew Along series. And today we're gonna to talk about the finishing steps and all the final details. And I'm gonna finish my shirt. All of these finishing ideas and techniques can be used in other projects. So if you're just joining us, feel free to watch along because you'll still find value in these techniques. And you can always go back to the beginning after if you want. I'm gonna start with hemming my shirt. So most of our edges have already been finished or hemmed during our construction process. So all we have left is the bottom. So I'm just gonna go ahead and do mine with a simple rolled hem. This is just a standard rolled hem. So simply fold the hem twice and you're gonna secure it with a whip stitch. Now here I'm using, a, oh, it's about a half an inch um, hem allowance. You could go smaller than that. Um, or you could do something decorative at the bottom, but most of the shirts have just a simple rolled hem. Friend, I'm Lelena with Thimble and Plume and we are historical costumers and we love sharing the things that we have learned over the years in order to empower you to become the best costumer you can be. So let's talk about reinforcements. There are several areas on the shirt that are either going to be weak points or areas where you might have some tears from use. So I want to go through and reinforce some of these areas. Methods that show up in surviving garments are various. You can have added patches or strips of fabric, decorative stitching including embroidery, insertion stitches, needle lace, buttonhole or blanket stitch, as well as braids, trim, and lace. For the side opening, I decided to keep it pretty simple and we're just going to be using a square of fabric. So this is a one and a half inch by one and a half inch square. And I'm going to fold the cut edges over first place along the opening, then we'll just attach using a whip stitch all around it. Another option that I have seen in Patterns of Fashion for is inserting a small gusset here, which is something that often shows up in modern menswear as well. On to the intersection between the neckline and the shoulder seam. So I wanted to point out a careless mistake that I made. When I was doing my pleating I wasn't very careful and you can see here I should have pleated down to the shoulder seam but I am about a half an inch away from it. So this is causing the shoulders of my final shirt to sit a little lower than I would have liked. So just a, a word of caution to be careful when you do your pleats. I wanted to keep it fairly simple and low key. Now we've already finished the shoulder seam with a flat fell seam. So I'm not too worried about reinforcing the shoulder seam which you do see in some shirts from the period. So instead, I'm just gonna do a small little strip right here, we're at that stress point that we snipped away because that's probably, not only is there going to be a lot of stress on this area, but it's going to the point where it's going to tear eventually. So let's just head that off and reinforce it now. So since the top of this will be under the collar stay, I am just going to leave it flat instead of folding it under, thereby reducing the amount of bulk. So here it is, the finished strip reinforcement that we are using to reinforce the area between the collar and the shoulder where we clipped in order to turn those seam allowances in different directions. Next up, we're going to move on to adding our stays to our collars and cuffs. So I've already blocked and steamed the section, so make sure you do that before you continue. You'll want to take your next stay, place it around your neck pin it in place and we're going to mark where our side seams will sit because our we have less circumference in the back of our neck than the front of our neck so we want to adjust for that here so we'll put the side seams on our shirt at these marks. 
So here I am placing those marks at the side seams of the collar and we'll pin those in place and then work around the rest of the collar, pinning it in place. Now collars and cuffs get an incredible amount of wear and tear and they also are the areas that are going to be rubbing up against your, your wrists and your neck. So a lot of times they do get quite dingy. So while this step isn't 100% necessary, I highly recommend it as it will give your clothing much longer lifetime. And then when these stays wear out, you can cut them out and add in new ones, thus extending the life of your shirt even longer. When you get to the front edge, make sure that you're lining it up so that both edges are lined up perfectly. You can offset the stay piece just a little bit behind the front of the collar. You can also sandwich your ties in here, but I am using a different method for today. And then you'll repeat the same procedure on the cuffs. The neckline, especially right at the bottom of the slit, gets a lot of wear and tear, and it's really easy to actually tear that opening even further. So it's really important to find a really good way of reinforcing this area, and there's lots of options. A lot of times you'll see decorative stitches or trim or some sort of braid applied to the edge or even hem stitching. For my neckline, I wanted to do something a little bit more decorative, a little more creative. So as I was looking over portraits from the time period, I did see a lot of what looked like buttonhole stitch. And I know that buttonhole stitch was used on the Mary of Hungary gown, as well as a lot of the shirts and shifts in the patterns of fashion four. Now I'm trying to keep this shirt fairly simple. So I decided to go with white thread, keep the monochromatic theme I've been going with so far. So I just went ahead and I started out by doing a buttonhole stitch running down one side of the neck and I'm going to do what's called a buttonhole insertion. And basically what this is, is we'll go ahead and do some close together buttonhole stitches right here, right down to the bottom of the slit. And then we'll come up to the other side and we'll connect the buttonhole stitches as we make new ones. So basically what we're doing here is we will take our thread and place it through one of the previous buttonhole stitches on the first side. Then we'll come down and create a new buttonhole stitch on the other side. Going back through the buttonhole stitch on the original side. and coming down to the new side and making another buttonhole stitch right next to the old one. So what this does is this ends up connecting the buttonhole stitches and you can take this up a little ways up the collar, excuse me, up the neckline and then continue with your buttonhole stitches um, all the way up. And you can place these buttonhole stitches close together. You can place them farther apart. You can do them in groups of three or four, whatever suits your fancy. Once you've finished with your neckline, go ahead and move on to your cuffs. And this extra added stitching at the bottom really does a nice job of adding some additional strength to an area that gets a lot of additional stress. So next, we need to decide on our closures for our collars and cuffs. Although actually we should have decided on that in the design phase, and I'll actually tell you why in this next section. Once again, we have many options available to us. You can use hooks and eyes, buttons or toggles with loops or button holes and ties. I love the look of ties on the collar area. So we're gonna stick with that. And I found this one particular portrait that I absolutely loved. So I want to incorporate the tassels like these ones here. As far as what to use for the ties, I have found that I prefer using cotton crochet thread. Now I know this isn't the most historically accurate material to use, but I have found that it really does hold up well. And for today's, for today's project, we are using a size five cotton crochet thread. So I've taken three 25 inch lengths of the crochet thread, threading them onto my needle, and then I will put them through the collar and then I will double them up and make sure that they're evenly at the bottom. And then I'm going to divide them up into three groups because we're going to braid this. It 
helps to anchor this down to something that you can pull against so that you have some tension as you're braiding and you can get a much tighter braid that way. You can also finger loop braid. I actually usually prefer that, but I was looking for something a bit faster than that for, to demonstrate to you. And this is something that is easily done. It's just the same as braiding hair. So as we approach the end, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tie them into a knot at the end here. And so the ends up here will now create my tassel. Not really thrilled with this particular tassel. So I think I'm gonna make a separate to go on this and let's try that out and see how it looks. So first thing I'm gonna do is secure the end of the braid so that it doesn't unravel. And I've just done this by tying it into a simple knot. Then I'm going to just make a tassel as you would any other tassel. I'm using my fingers here to wrap it around because it doesn't need to be very big. I think I went about 10 to 12 times. And then I will use the ends of the tie to secure the tassel here. Oh yes, I'm much happier with that tassel. Okay, let's move on to the cuffs. So one of the problems I always have with my cuffs is when I use ties, it is really hard to tie them myself. I've also used button loops and that never seems to work out really well either. Plus, I don't have any good buttons here. So I decided to try something new and I, do, I think this is going to be the best option. One of the bows that you see a lot is what we often term a Elizabethan bow. It's a bow that is tied with just one cord. So I'm gonna try that. And the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to put a tie on one side. I'm gonna put an eyelet in the other side of the cuff. And this is something you see a lot where they have put eyelets into the collar and cuff in order to hold the ties so the ties can be removed. The only problem with that is that I lose all my ties all the time. And then, by, and then I'll go to put it on in an event or something and I don't have any way to tie on my shirt. And then trying to put them on yourself going through both eyelets is really difficult. So I'm going to connect the tie to one side and have an eyelet on the other side. I'll use an Elizabethan bow to tie it, which is actually I find easier to do when I only have one hand available to me. And also because the tie is attached to the other side, I won't lose it. I hope, I shouldn't, I mean. It's possible. Here is an example of why it's important to plan out your design beforehand. As you see here, I'm having to embroider these eyelets over my smocking because I changed what I was going to do. Originally, I had just planned on doing them button and loops, but since I changed my plan at the last minute, I wasn't, I didn't think about it. And so I didn't set the smocked section back behind the cuff. So now I'm having to embroider my eyelets through my hard work. So once I've got that done, I take the ties from one side and I'm going to secure them through the eyelet so that I never have to put them through the eyelet when I have it on. I'll pull them through and then I will just tie a knot into the um, ends of these so that hopefully they don't pull back out. this will work out well and it may not but that's the fun part for me one of the best parts about historical reenactment is that experimental archaeology that we get to do we get to try these techniques 
put them on, wear them, and see how they work. That's the connection with the past that gives me that rush and the drive to do the next experiment. Okay, let's try it out, huh? So if you're looking for another sew along, we have this series here that walks you through how to make a headdress for a 16th century German woman. Otherwise, you may find this video interesting. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.